Um, I'm so grateful um, and honored by the opportunity to uh, be with you today, but also tomorrow. Mm. This will be the first of three talks. And I'd like to begin by providing my most sincere gratitude to Sahodul for all his organization for the event, uh, with his tireless work um, to pull this together. And um, to thank uh, others, particularly Dr. Jushin Yu, who also uh, contributed to that effort and was foundational in terms of ensuring that the U of S would be in a position to host an event like this and many others to benefit students such as you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> today I'm going to be talking about uh, a subject which um, is, is interesting from many different angles. It's a very practical subject. It's a subject which unites two very different areas and very rapidly evolving computational areas for insight into the health domain that I'm going to be emphasizing, but also other domains. Combining data science on the one hand with system science and the other, the science of the whole. It's also distinguished <clears throat> by the fact that it's a very powerful technique to allow us to take advantage of big data. Big data, using that term in a way that relates to Google's common definition with the four Ps. High volume, that's the big in big data. But maybe more to the point for these methods, high velocity, data coming in very frequently. Smartphones and, and wearables, maybe every few seconds or less or more frequently. Uh, with uh, epidemiological platforms monitoring social media twi um, uh, tweets, for example. Perhaps every hour or two, a health-related tweet will come in or down to the level of minutes. These are high-velocity data sources compared to traditional data, which might involve surveys asked once a week or once a quarter. That's the second V. Third V, variety. These techniques bring together the capacity to link up data sources from the same underlying system that relate to different areas of the system and provide a holistic picture of what's going on. Finally, veracity. Data sources that can pick up with greater reliability patterns of human behavior and exposures compared to when we self-report them. Okay. Um, so these techniques have a, have a special role to play in exploiting at least two of those, the velocity and the variety. Techniques, though, are also distinguished by the fact that they're deep. And in fact, there's at least four different levels at which you can substantively carry away insight from the techniques that I'll be talking about today. One level, a philosophical level, a level involving the role of theory-based models compared to less theory-based methods. And combining theory, on the one hand, as captured by dynamic models, these mechanistic models, with empirical data as it comes in. Secondly, beyond the philosophical level, the intuitive level. Level at which you you, you kind of get what's going on at a deep level, even if you don't know all the details. Thirdly, a mathematical level involving distributions and, and understanding what's going on in terms of the distributions. And fourthly, at a mathematical level in terms of how those distributions are captured in terms of important sampling, sequential important sampling, sampling from the distributions. Four different levels. And today, I'm going to try to hit all four. Okay? I recognize, potentially for the mathematically thick later components of that, perhaps not everyone will walk out of here grokking fully what's going on, fully internalizing how all this fits together. 
If you do, you can walk with a lighter step and a feeling of rightful pride and exhilaration on what's possible. But many of you will probably be still a bit confused about exactly how the distributions are captured. There may be even some elements of that, that derivation in terms of distributions. But you should carry away the intuition and perhaps a bit of the philosophy as well. So I'm going to try to make sure, given the breadth of the audience, that some components of this are accessible to everyone in the world. Everyone should be able to take away something substantive I should note, I gave this talk, a variant of it, eight days ago at MIT. And they were amazed at what's possible and urged proceeding with descriptions in the literature and gave invitations for, for, for uh, potential venues for that. And um, so a lot of excitement extending uh, around the labs of modelers like me. Um, but others uh, working worldwide at this intersection of, of data science and system science. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, within today's talk, I'm going to be hitting, pursuant to that broad set of goals, a bit of perspective and context, where I'm coming from. You'll see it creep out of me at various times, these little bits, and you'll have some sense of where that's coming from. I'm then going to provide, as I will for each of my three talks, today, tomorrow morning, and tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to provide a little extra beyond the analytic methods. I'm going to be highlighting batteries are dead, but my voice lives on. Um, I'm going to be highlighting, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a set of novel data sources. For every talk, I'm going to highlight analytic methods, yes, but I'm going to highlight data sources as well of great relevance because they're big data sources. They have those four things. Volume, velocity, variety, veracity that distinguish them and particularly are well-crafted to health. Okay? So today I'm going to be talking about search volume data. That should be accessible to everyone. I'm then going to go into a brief introduction to a technique that I would argue rightfully belongs in the pantheon of data science techniques. It's a heavily computational technique that has led countless insights with lots of data. But it's not a machine learning technique. It's a mechanistic modeling technique. And that concerns um, a modeling dynamic model. And particularly, I'm going to focus here on compartmental models, ordinary differential equation models. If I could just ask, how many people here have taken a course which has involved some, much, or exclusive focus on differential equations? Good folks. And those who haven't, I'd encourage you to think about it. I think you'll get a lot of insights. Those who have, rest assured there'll be a lot to, to grab onto here. These are ordinary differential equations we'll be talking about. I'm then going to go through some intuitions for particle filtering and go into two case studies, which are pi particle filtering in the health field associated, as it turns out, with communicable disease on the white case influenza or on the next measles. <clears throat> this work builds on the, the foundational contributions of students in this room, such as Lee Sha Yang here in the front row, and should be credited to her. It also builds on uh, a set of collaborations uh, that I've been running with some of the other faculty you may have encountered, uh, particularly Dr. Liu, uh, Zhu Xie Liu um, in Math and Stats, who was um, uh, of, of essential uh, role play and essential role in making this event possible. We're then going to be talking about what particle filtering is at a distribution level and how we realize it at the level of sampling as time allows. And I'm going to talk about some broad principles here. How with these models it's important to balance stochastics, the prospects of conducting particle filtering with other types of dynamic models, to wit, 
agent-based models, and I'll provide a summary. I will note that these slides are all publicly available. This talk is being recorded and will be publicly available on YouTube before the sun sets. And ladies and gentlemen, if you go to this URL here, I apologize for its most un aesthetically unpleasant placement, but if you go to tinyurl.com slash spiralpf, um, you can download all these slides, and probably more than you want, on supplemental material, which provide nitty gritty uh, mathematical underpinnings for this method. Okay. So supplemental material is available there. Okay, let's, let's just um, talk about um, my work. My work lies at the intersection broadly of four methodological areas, three of which are shown here, one of which is so ubiquitous I don't even want to put it in. System science, science of the whole, computational science, and data science. The fourth that I haven't put in there is applied mathematics, um, which, which undergirds many aspects of each of these and many other areas. But my work is, is distinguished in this area by being applied to um, health and health care. Um, uh, also, some cognate areas, community safety and well-being areas uh, directly cognate to this. I work a fair bit um, cross-sectorally now. And my work lies at, at the intersection of all of these. My, my home department is computer science, um, and we leverage cutting-edge computational techniques, but we do so in ways that leverage these two other very fast advancing areas of insight for making sense of patterns in the world and helping us act more judiciously, system science and data science. And various components of what we'll be talking about uh, in the next three lectures today and the two tomorrow uh, are, are actually highlighted here in red. Uh, for example, tomorrow I'll be introducing our smartphone-based data collection system uh, and through the IEPI project and, and realized uh, most recently as Ethica, et cetera. Um, now, uh, I have, I have a, a, a very specific perspective, a biased perspective on data science. I'm interested in data science very broadly. My first course in data science was taken, I believe, in 1993 at MIT as a graduate student, as a doctoral student in computer science from uh, someone who's now one of the, the top administration officials at MIT, Eric Brimson, an Esteban boy from here in Saskatchewan. Um, and uh, I've, I've retained a strong interest in that, but I've retained it in parallel with an interest in understanding how to more effectively grapple with systems in the world that are gnarly, complex, and that thwart seat of the pants management. And that's a very large fraction of systems out there. It's almost all of the systems that are societally challenging to work with. Um, these, these gnarly um, problems that are, reflect complexity, wicked problems, complex problems. And that has to do with the, the uh, system science components. And so I'm interested in data science, particularly through the lens of what I like to call systems competent data science. It recognizes that, that individual time series, while they can be analyzed in isolation, often they're coming from an underlying system that has a certain unity to it, a certain cohesion to it. And by taking advantage of that fact, we can get a lot more insights. I'm also interested in understanding the patterns through things like machine learning tools and analysis not merely to reflect on associations between variables, but to ask proactively about what we can do better to navigate these systems, to minimize the blowback, to achieve more with less, to achieve more bang for the buck um, in ways of lowering health burden. So I'm interested, in short, in counterfactual. Situations which have not yet been observed, but which we need to reason about. And that takes us out of the realm of traditional data science, which is about analyzing data that we've collected from a data generating process that has been operating, 
to instead focus on the area as well of system science, which is about being able to reason causally about the underlying systems and ask what would happen if we did this thing different. Recognizing, by so doing, we are altering the data generating process. And we are going to be needing to make sense of new associations that come out of it. So I'm interested in the data generating processes underlying observables. We see data, and that's great. But if we leave, if, if we simply take that data as a given and don't inquire about the process that gave rise to it, we're leaving money on the table. We're, we're sacrificing opportunity for much greater insight, is, is my conviction. That's my bias. But it's a bias, ladies and gentlemen, for which I've dedicated the past 30 years of my life, past 20 in the health sphere. Um, so you will see elements of this bias coming out, particularly today, in motivating these methods. Um, as I said, today's lecture is going to be of a cloth with the other two, in the sense that I'll be emphasizing machine learning, big data sources that help strengthen it, the role of theory, and a diversity of methods to make sense. Okay. Um, so. It's a bit of, on uh, perspectives. Um, I'd like to, as your stomachs and mind, digest that wonderful breakfast that they've provided to us. I'd like to talk about a um, big data source that we're going to be tapping within this talk. This will be by way of letting your brain warm up a bit. Okay. We're going to gather momentum, and we're going to go next into a discussion of compartmental models, which are new to a fair number of you likely. Um, and then we're going to start getting into particle filtering and getting into the mathematical basis of particle filtering. That, by that point, we will be traveling quite fast. Okay, okay let's talk about big data sources. Um, we're going to be hearing about several of them, and I've, I've articulated them here. Search monitoring, Twitter monitoring, mobile data collection, data collection from wearables and, and uh, smartphones. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about search monitoring, and monitoring volumes of search data is probably something that most of you have encountered at one point or another. It provides insight into knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, interests on the part of the population, um, and uh, it can provide some indication of the dynamics that changes the behavior in that interest over time. Individual behavior is not captured. If we have a thousand searches occurring in a day for a given topic, we don't know if it was a thousand individuals each searching once or one individual searching a thousand times. Right? Um, now, there's different providers who provide this information. The one I'll focus on today without loss of generality is, is Google. Okay? Google Trends. Many of you have seen this. Many of you may have heard about its derivative Google Flu Trends, which uh, had prominence for several years. And this is the Google Trends interface. If you want, you can fire it up and, and go to Google Trends. And um, by articulating a search, you can see over time for a given jurisdiction, this is Canada up here, our home and native or, or adopted land. Um, and uh, you can see the, the results over time and the relative levels of searching that went on for this jurisdiction over this time period. This is 2004 to present. And you notice an interesting pattern there. Um, there's oscillation seasonally. The oscillations are actually growing over time, right? Um, and the, the total volume of searches is higher. This is a relative axis. It doesn't tell you there are 50 people searching on that certain month or something like that. It tells you relative to the other months, this is 50, that's 10, that's one, um, it, it's relative levels, it's proportioned, okay? Uh, proportional. And it gives you some sense of where these searches are occurring for, but you notice it's growing. And you might posit many reasons for that. Maybe a growing interest in Lyme disease. Or maybe it's just more people using Google and conducting searching on Google. Um, a couple notes about this. As I said, it's relative. There's moderate temporal and geographic resolution. You can get down to the day, which by traditional epidemiological standards, traditional data, health data collection is 
pretty darn good, but it's it's a lot slower than we'll we'll see from wearables and smartphones um, tomorrow. Um, the level of geographic uh, disaggregation actually depends. You can get northern and southern Saskatchewan. You can get particular areas around large cities. Um, they they want a certain level of privacy insured, and they they don't let you. Um, get too fine grain in your in your um, in your resolution um, spatially, uh, and depending on what time frame you examine, it'll actually change the time granularity. So if you ask 2004 to present, it will give you data on a per month basis. If you ask the last two weeks, it may give you data on a per three hour basis. Okay. Um, Comparisons are possible, and uh, you can download the results, um, and you can actually search by, uh, by terms or not. So for example, I could do a comparison. So here's Lyme disease uh, in blue, and here is West Nile. We see trends for both, but interestingly, these are the opposite trends. West Nile, high interest early on. In Canada, it kind of petered out with, with an exception uh, here in about 2012. By contrast, Lyme disease has been going up. Both are zoonoses, both are vector-borne uh, diseases that uh, can uh, cause great harm to individuals, but you see opposite uh, patterns. Um, so much for the idea that all those patterns are driven just by levels of, of use of Google and day-to-day and -day searching. Um, you can also see something about uh, where those come from. It also provides, um, um, as I said, uh, uh, differing levels of, of access uh, depending on when you search. And importantly, you can make searches that are not just for terms, like, like the verbatim terms, Lyme disease, say hypertension, um, it'll, you'll find hypertension. Instead, you could search for it as a concept. For example, hypertension is often goes by the name, anyone know? What, informally, what do people, High blood pressure. So people might search, be interested in hypertension, they happen to search for it, high blood pressure. Maybe they search for it here in Canada in French. Right? Um, uh, and this will kind of bundle together a bunch of different search terms with different hyphenations or abbreviations into one. Which is it's pretty useful. You can see the gap there. Right? Um, and uh, you can look at a disease and its underlying pathway, like Lyme disease versus tick bite, people searching, or disease and its symptoms, Lyme disease and rash. The bullseye rash is, is, is one of the signs that, that Lyme might be uh, uh, present uh, from, a, from a tick bite. Um, and you can see some interesting patterns. This is for the childhood communicable disease pertussis on which uh, Lisha, again, has done some wonderful additional work. And it shows whooping cough searches in Australia. Do you notice a curious change in tempo at a certain date there? Anyone? Is there, is there a change in kind of the patterning here? When, when would you say there's a change? Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's right about here. It turns out that it's about in March 2015. Okay, this is sudden, kind of this lower levels of interest and in sudden, and then after that, there's this kind of persistent, uh, for several years, this persistent level of searching. Turns out that in March of 2015, there was a tragic case of baby Riley in, in uh, Australia, um, a baby that died from, from pertussis, having not been vaccinated to protect. Okay. And it led to a public um, uh, public outcry and, and concerns about um, the vulnerability of children to child infectious diseases in an age of declining vaccination rates. And it changed the discourse and the interest for several years. So it's, it's very powerful to provide um, some understanding of, of some of the temporal patterns. Here's Zika virus. And interestingly, by using a tool called Google Correlate, you can actually go and you can find other things that people are searching for with patterns a lot like Zika. Patterns not necessarily textually defined, but in terms of over time, they vary, very, very similarly. They correlate to each other. And you can see it's actually fairly insightful. Some people are searching for spelling with a C and leaving up virus. 
other spell it Z-Y-C-A, um, misspellings of Zinka, Zika, Zitka. Um, people are trying to get information about this, very likely, by different names. And Google Correlate can give you an understanding of what people might be searching for, even in other languages. Okay. Um, okay. Data sources, ladies and gentlemen. Data sources. Bit of background there. We're going to use this. About half an hour, you're going to be wondering, why is he talking about search volume? And then it's going to come back big time um, for one of our examples. Okay. Next, I want to talk about compartmental models. Why do we build these models? Why do we build dynamic models? This model is the mechanism of the system which captures the theory dynamic hypotheses for what's going on in the data generating process from a, a data science perspective? Well, we're facing ever, ever rising and more complex challenges. I spoke of it before. And for the past 30 or so years, there's been a very active area of formal, formally recognized area uh, field um, called complexity science or system science, is the term popularized by the NIH. And it helps us reason about these complex systems, these systems where the, the whole is different than the sum of the parts, systems where we can't take a system a piece apart into pieces and expect to understand the system as a whole. Rather, we have to understand it, not just the pieces, but how they all relate to each other to understand why we get behavior from the system as a whole that's very different from what we expect from any one piece or any average of pieces. So these tools help us reason and help us manage about these systems. Manage meaning better interact with them, get less broadsided by them or, or blowback by them, um, and are better able to, to handle them in an efficient and effective fashion. Okay? In a central way where system science achieves this is through dynamic models. Okay? Um, and these models represent hypotheses concerning generative mechanisms. What's going on in this data generating process out there? How things might work? And they can serve as, as thinking tools. Okay, so I'm going to be um, talking about many aspects of this and trying to keep you awake here. So these go by many different names, these models. <coughs> Mathematical models. Me models of the mechanics of a system or the physics of the system. <coughs> These are models that depict hypothesized causal pathways within the system. In a way, not entirely different from Judea Pearl's tradition of, of positing certain causal pathways in a statistical sense, but quite different in some of the particulars and the consequences. They simulate the step-by-step -step evolution of the system over time. They simulate how the system evolves as a microworld and how it gives rise to observed data. Okay? And um, because a model like this captures posited, hypothesized causality, we can use it to reason if we take that causality as, as solid, if we take it as a working hypothesis, that that's what's going on. We can reason about what its consequences will be over time. We can test those consequences against observed data. But we can also ask about, since it's a causal model, model that posits causality, about counterfactuals. Okay? We can ask about the counterfactual, about situations we haven't observed before and where there's not data that has come out of them because they haven't been around before, and we can reason about them. So here's a, a classic poem. Some of you may have seen these in your classes, perhaps even have been unfortunate enough to see them in my class. Okay, I guess the brains aren't fully woke. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, this uh, is a uh, one form of of dynamic model. Let's see, there's a bunch of different forms. This is a compartmental model, which will be the subject of today's examples um, that we're going to be talking about combining with big data sources. And here we divide the population up into a set of categories. So there's susceptible people, infected people, and recovered people. 
Infected people can transmit the infection and are also infected by it. We'll assume they're, they're one and the same. And over time, people shift between categories by, for example, getting infected or coming into the system through immigration or recovering from their illness. Okay. This is a mechanistic model. And uh, it, it requires a specification of the initial state of that model, rules that indicate how the state changes. I'm being deliberately very high level here in a way that applies to these different traditions, which are very different, agent-based modeling, discrete event simulation, and compartmental. So how the state changes based on the current state. Um, and uh, based on that, the initial state and these rules, we can run the system out over time. This little micro world simulated mimics um, what we think might be going on in the world, okay? So we take a model like that, and if we want to illustrate it mathematically, we might use nice short notation, um, just pick more convenient words so we don't have to write out things and using long variable names, a longhand. Um, and uh, we have some governing equations. Sanity check? Do people know what that dot means over the... Uh, these variables on the left-hand side here, this is a set of state equations. What, is, what does it mean, an R dot? Anyone see that before? Maybe in a physics class long, long ago? The first derivative? Yeah, it's the first derivative. It's, it's derivative over time. It's the derivative over time. It's the rate of change of R. If R dot is five per month, there is five more people per month who are coming in, and the, the rate of the, the number of people who are recovered is rising at five per month. If it's negative, it's negative five, it's falling at five per month. These are the rates of change. And here we have rates of change on the left based on some function of the state on the right as given by, by those uh, formulae. And this is a set of ordinary differential equations or state equations phrased in ordinary differential equation way. And you'll notice that the different components of this map directly to this. So this flow between S and I goes directly to this. It comes out of S, hence it's minus. If, if this flow, if tons of people start coming down here, if you have a thousand people per day who are getting sick, S is going to be dropping. 1,000 people per day, um, it's going to be dropping by 1,000 people a day compared to the value it would have otherwise had. And they're coming into, that same flow is coming into I. So it's coming into I with a positive sign. So it's coming into I here. And similarly, this flow is flowing out, and it's coming into R. So these flows uh, have conservation properties. The, it comes out of this, it goes into that comes out of I, goes into R in the same way that's uh, mathematically clear. I don't expect you to master this, but we'll see a lot of these in coming minutes, okay? This is a mechanistic model. We're positing why it is we see a certain value for the number of people getting infected. It's because <coughs> infections, effectives are mixing with susceptibles in this kind of random way that leads to contacts and it leads to this sort of level of, uh, of, of people per unit time, say day, that are getting infected as, as given by this equation. Okay, so a model like this is capturing a theory of the system. It's positing uh, a work, as a working hypothesis, this is kind of how things work. People get infected because of, you know, contacts between infections and recoveries. That people recover with an average time in the infection stock as given by mu here, okay? Or mu is like five days. They stay on average infected for five days before getting back. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a model of the physics of the system, of the mechanics of the system. <coughs> and it's gonna be extraordinarily useful for reason why we see data from different components of it and together with machine learning methods for making sense of that data about what it tells us about what's going on, not just where we observe the data, say here, but for the system as a whole. Mark my words. We're going to be able to use models like this to understand from pieces of data from one piece of system, they will illuminate the system as a whole by virtue of the, the inexorable logic 
of the model that we have posited. Just as a light bulb might be here physically, but illuminates the room. Just as if a stream of people coming through that door very quickly would tell us something sensibly about, oh, there's a lot of people outside this door. We're going to be able to use data from one piece of the system or multiple pieces to illuminate the system as a well. whole. Okay. That's, that's at, a, at a philosophical level part of what's going on here, part of the intuition as well. Okay. So having represented this, we can then, it entails behavior over time. If we posit this, there is a behavior implied for this system over time. S, I, and R will change in a certain way. And typically, we can't pre-calculate it. We, we, we lack the mathematics for nonlinear models to be able to, to just write down what that equation is for how uh, the number of infected people are changing over time. It's implied, but in order to, get to, to derive how it's changing over time, we have to simulate it, much as the halting problem tells us, in order to tell if a program halts, we can't look at it and just say, this is going to halt. The only way we can tell is to is keep on running and running and running until it halts. And we'll never know if it won't halt. Because just a little bit more running might lead it to halt. Same thing with the simulation. We have to, in order to get the to know what, what's implied, we have to simulate it. And so patterns are entailed by equations and particular values for the constants and the initial values. Okay? It turns out there's many ways to frame models like this. I hope my students are really paying attention to how I'm framing this. You might get some different twists to your understanding of things. I don't think I've ever shared that perspective, the link between the halting problem and, uh, and simulation before. But it's one I've nurtured for many years. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, there's multiple ways we build models like this. And some of those in the room have been pioneers in applying both the techniques I'm talking about today, particle filtering, and using many of these methods. And Wei Chong, Wen Shil over there, is just a master at these different methods and has applied many others as well. Li Xiaoyan has also been known to, uh, to apply both with grace and, and uh, facility um, and to great effect. So we have system dynamics, which is going to be the focus of our, our examples today. Agent-based modeling, where we're simulating each person in the population. I'll talk about that and the implications for that. And discrete event modeling, which is focused on structured workflows. Sometimes these models are very sophisticated. This, is Ching Yang here? Yeah, yeah. She's heard enough of it. Um, so uh, my student Ching Yang, this is uh, some of her work on a multi-scale model of diabetes, which involves physiology all the way up to public health level. And uh, this one recognizes the lion by his claw. Uh, Bernoulli said that of Newton, and I will say it of Chen Wei Chong. Um, so this is a wind chill where, or this is a wind, a wind chill, <laughs> this is a wind chillian model where uh, we have individuals scattered throughout LA who are purchasing food from, from different stores. Now, these models, I, I just want to give a bit of perspective because it's important that I, that I communicate a philosophical stance here with these models. It does, it does get into the philosophy of particle filtering. Dynamic models are best not used. They can be misused as crystal balls, but that's a gross misuse. They're much more valuable, not as a crystal ball, but as a prosthesis. You say, huh, huh. I know we're in a health science building, but why is he talking about artificial legs and crutches and wheelchairs and so on? Well, bear me out on this. Uh, listen, listen just a little bit. Prostheses. So some years ago, I don't think Winchell, Winchell will remember it, but I think he's the only one in the room. Um, I broke my foot. Actually, in the same stairwell I took to come here today, I realized I said, oh, this is, this is where I broke my foot. Um, bad news. And I went around for several months with uh, crutches. And what those crutches allowed me to do, like a good prosthesis, is achieve full functionality despite my limitations. You might remember it, but I think she was in Singapore at the time. Um, 
So I was able to get around. I was able to achieve near full functionality. In fact, I came from the emergency room to give a lecture about modeling, dynamic modeling, um, immediately, as I recall. Uh, it was a memorable lecture for the students because it was the only one where they had ever seen me sitting. Um, and, uh, and I was in incredible pain, but, but the beauty of the modeling carried it through. Um, and it, it provided sucker. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, I went around and I achieved near full functionality despite my limitations. And that's what prostheses allow us to do. We have limitations though that, that our models address that are not physical in nature. They're not a broken foot or a gimp arm. It's rather cognitive limitations. If, if you take the most brilliant mathematical experts, you know, the best implied mathematicians in the world. You put this in front of Gilbert Strang, my old faculty member at MIT, whose patterns I mimic to this day, then you will find that they can't reason about it instantly. They, they, they can't see what this immediately implies for a general model of this sort. It's cognitively, we're not wired to do this. And there's some great experiments at MIT by John Sturman and others, which have actually put STEM students, uh, such as my ilk, my kind, um, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics students from MIT, uh, graduate students, paired them up with models and basically say, try to manage these models. Try to, try to work with them to achieve some goal. And they're horrible at it. We're horrible at it because we're not wired to do this. It's, it's, it, it, we're very poor at reasoning about these things. But a computer is really good at reasoning about these. And computers serve as prostheses. They complement our cognitive limitations and they let us do things we never otherwise would have been able to, much like the crutches in my ability to get around. So ladies and gentlemen, models like this are learning tools. They help us. It's not that they are right. It's not that they articulate the truth. They just get us to the truth faster by allowing us to more quickly spot misunderstandings in our heads. These my students. I'm trying to try to get these things because I, I feel that I've neglected them in the day-to-day -day bustle of our lab. So they help us more quickly spot when our thinking just ain't so. It just doesn't jive with the world. That we think this is how it is out there, we build a model, we simulate, and we find it just doesn't add up. It, it implies something that's very different from what we see from the world. That's not a failure of a model. It's a success of modeling that we've spotted this misunderstanding and we we, we spot this inconsistency between wh how we think the world wa uh, works as articulated in our head and by a model that captures that and what we observe from the world that's inconsistent with that. We say, oh, I always thought it was that, but it can't be, because that's right, it wouldn't jibe. And then we advance our thinking and, by extension, our modeling. And often we undertake interventions in the world and, and see their results and we compare them to the model. And like so many great insights, many brilliant folks have said it, including even in antiquity here, uh, Francis Bacon, who uttered in the 17th century, truth sooner emerges from error than from confusion. Take some stance, try it as a working hypothesis, test it in the clear light of day, see if it drives with the evidence, and if it doesn't, that's not a liability. That's not a, a failure of, of your capacity. It's a success of learning. Okay. Um, so that's what these models are articulated. Now, one of the key uses for them, and this gets critically to the philosophy of what we're doing today, is to be able to reason about counterfactuals. We have a theory about how causality functions in the system and by extension to give rise to the data. And we have some understanding of how intervention is affected. And if we're just reasoning based on, on our heads and our informal reasoning, we, we, can't, we can't easily say how, if we intervene in the system, it's going to change things for the better. 
If we're just reasoning on, based on intuition, we fall terribly short for even the simplest system John Sturman's work. I, uh, I was very fortunate, very fortunate indeed to have John Sturman watching this talk last week and providing critiques of, of the methods and uh, was happy to see his enthusiasm for what I'm presenting. But I would also know, for those who are interested in data science, that if you're relying purely on patterns, associations that you've observed, say between a, an aspect of the system and another, and you try to alter one of those to try to affect the other, that association may be totally different to the altered system because you've changed the underlying system. The data generating process is now different. And that treasured observation of some relationship between you know, variable A and variable B, maybe you observe something like that. If A is big, B is small, and vice versa. Maybe A is you know, level of folate, and B is risk of infant mortality or something. Um, and you might think, well, if we, you know, if we intervene to greatly increase the level of folate, the level of infant mortality will come down. Um, but it's not necessarily the case. In the altered system, that association might disappear. Now, in fact, this is the causal association I've shown. But in other cases, it might not be. And you alter the data generating process, and the and the uh, and the association is different. So, if we purely operate based on statistics. And we try to say, because of this association, changing this will automatically lead to a higher value of that. We're, we're not only on thin ice, we're trying to skate on water. <coughs> and it just it won't work. Okay? So mo causal models, models that posit causality, are critical here. And with a causal model, we can reason about the effects of, of, of intervention, conditional on that model being a reasonable working hypothesis, okay, or, or one that, that, that captures the, the essentials of the features. So these models have many use, which I don't have time to go into. And now, ladies and gentlemen, fortified by that understanding, we are going to get into the substance of particle filtering. Start talking about some of the intuition and then going into the particulars of how it's captured. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be using a certain context here. But it's far from a privileged or a unique one. We're going to be talking about outbreak responses, cases where we have a model of some infectious condition, some communicable condition, typically. Um, and we have data coming in, and we want to understand where are we at right now, how many infected people are there likely out there, where is the system going to go after this, and what interventions might be most effective. The problem is, if we look at the data alone, it doesn't tell us where it's going. It tells us where it's been. It doesn't tell us where it's going. And it doesn't tell us about fully what's going on in the underlying system, just who happened to get reported. And with traditional modeling, we, we build these models and we use them for insight. But to update them to reflect the latest data is a fairly heavyweight process. And even the best of these models, even the most finely evidenced model, eventually it's going to diverge from the world because it can't anticipate, amongst other things, stochastics in the world. And it's going to diverge unless we kind of keep it updated. So the goal here, the overall motivation for the methods here is to have quickly formulated, frequently regrounded models, dynamic models that stay constantly updated with the latest evidence, and that we can use to therefore ask what's going on in the system, What's the underlying latent state of the system? We can ask, where is it going? And we can ask, what interventions would be most effective in nudging it in the way that we'd like, like towards lower burden of, of infection. Okay. So the idea is we're going to keep this model updated with data. We're going to avoid open loop models. You folks have been here a number of days. You've witnessed weather dry and wet. You know your way from here to your domicile probably very well. You have a good mental model of it. But you'd almost never think to walk that way, to walk home with your eyes closed. It would be a point of madness, right? 
Some of you would, would get injured, potentially killed. You'd be crossing when the street light isn't red and, and uh, could get hit by a car or step off a curb and end up like me, not four years then with a broken foot. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're trying to avoid having our models flying blind as well. Even a very good model, if it's blind, if it can't see new data coming in, it's operating with a blindfold and it will end up in a bad way. So a model like this, that we might have data, and data in the communicable disease area, which is, is our water data right here, can be very noisy. There could be a high risk of infection in a given year. It just doesn't happen to occur. And that has consequences, because it means often susceptibles build up even more and even more, like, like dry wood accumulating as kindling until the fateful spark is launched. Okay, so here we might have a model that we build early on, and we run it and we anticipate what's going on, but as time passes, here once, we see successive data coming in that tells us it's very different than what we would have thought, and unless we update the model, the model's gonna be increasingly outdated in its expectation. What we're looking for is something here. These are like so many here. <laughs> Shall you have this great product. I'm so indebted to to her for this and many other factors. But here, we're going to have data coming in over time, and we're going to use that to ground the model, to sort of keep the model grounded on what's been seen, inform it with that data. And we're going to do so from all the data to this current point. And then, not having data from the future, or we don't have that option, um, we're going to be predicting forward. And here, I've shown actually just yeah it has shown um, uh, future data points and some of what the model might, might predict and we're going to do this probabilistically so these these blue the fact they're kind of fuzzy amorphous almost nebulae uh, in in uh, appearance that suggests there's a distribution here we're not putting all our eggs in one estimate a point estimate we're keeping our our options open with a distribution and we're going to see that we're going to be doing so not in a curve-fitting way. We're not going to be fitting this curve using some black box model, say a deep learning model, that exactly <coughs> matches the data we've seen and projects forward. No, nothing that crude. We can do something like that, but it doesn't capture the essence of what's going on. And so it will be by design self-defeating if the system has changed, like with an intervention. Rather, what we're going to do is ground the model's full understanding of what's going on. All aspects of the system depicted in the model will be informed by what's going on till now. So it has a complete understanding of latent state of the system at a probabilistic level. We can then use it to ask, well, what's coming up? If we change nothing, or if we change something, if we ask about counterfactuals, if we undertake this intervention or that one, what will be the consequence? Okay, so that's, that's where we're going with this. And there's a set of methods of great relevance. And I might talk with you about some of the others tomorrow, depending how these goes over. If all these seats are empty tomorrow, and you fled, well, I, I won't talk about this. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll talk about category theory or something. Um, but, um, but the fact is, these are awesome other methods. And tomorrow I'm gonna get into an absolutely delightful thing if you, if you offer me the privilege of, of speaking to you again, okay? Um, PMCMC, which takes these methods to a whole nother level. A method pioneered once again by members of our lab, such as Li Xiaoyan and by uh, Lutier um, and, uh, and others who have contributed as well as uh, the tutelage of Dr. Liu. So MCMC and particle MCMC are going to be relevant. We're going to be talking today about particle filtering. And here, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to sample from, we're going to estimate through sampling the underlying state of the dynamic model, estimating not just the number of people are going to get infected each day, but the full state of the model that gave rise to that infection, that, that state we saw earlier, you know, all aspects of 
of the, this. All four of these stocks will be estimated. How many people are susceptible? How many people are infected? We'll have a joint distribution over all of those for any given time. Okay, if you won't say it, I will. That's awesome. Okay, and, and we're going to have stochastically evolving parameters, parameters that we're not sure about and might vary like the reporting rate. To what likely is a family likely to report a baby who has measles, for example, or has pertussis, or an older person who has pertussis. And uh, we're going to then be able to run scenarios um, in a probabilistic way and, um, and uh, look at trade-offs between scenarios. Now, we've applied this to a wide variety. And I have to credit Dr. Jushin Liu here at the U of S for her untiring tolerance of working with me for so many of these. Um, we've, we've conducted this for uh, a wide variety of areas, and um, some areas, multiple models, um, uh, to, and, and found the method very, very effective. So this is a, a, very general, um, a very general approach that we're pushing out to more and more problems in the health space. Um, much of our interest um, is in the opioids area, for example, right now in West Nile, where Chin Yang is doing some absolutely wonderful stuff with, um, with data from, uh, from um, environmental observations concerning mosquito populations and hopefully sometime soon larvae. OK, so particle What is this thing that gives us this chocolatey goodness, this, this great set of advantages of articulated? Well, Basically, we need a simulation model that has some stochastics in it. We could do it in a model that's not stochastic, but the benefits for doing so are pretty thin. Okay? We use it to estimate what's going on in the underlying system. Uh, and um, to, to achieve benefit from that, typically there needs to be some model stochastics that open the model to different possibilities. It can't just be a totally deterministic model where all particles have the same value. There's some subtleties there of different particles started in initial, different initial states, but it's pretty thin pickets compared to a stochastic model. Um, and uh, the simulation model that we've seen, those differential equations, will run unmodified between observations. So there'll be observations occurring periodically. And between those, the model will just run out in its normal way, the way to which it has become accustomed to running. Okay? for a given particle. And then at the observations, the state of that model, the estimated situation in the model, will be estimated based on the observation. Okay. So we're going to take into account this observation. We're going to say, go figure. And it's going to compute, essentially through sampling, a new distribution, a joint distribution over the model state for that S, that I, that R, and any modifying parameters, it's going to have a new distribution estimated. Oh, that's what the observation was? OK, my, there must be a lot fewer susceptibles than I thought. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a new distribution where there's a, a high likelihood of being few susceptibles and a low likelihood of being many. It's performed recursively. This is extremely important, and it's of great value for some of our work, such as that being done by Duan Lujie, um, involving streaming data sources coming into these models. So the idea here is each new data point is going to be observed. Each new data point is going to be observed, and we're going to update the estimated state of the model. Okay, the model saying, oh, that's what it is. OK, now I think this is going on at this time. And it doesn't have to reconsider all the earlier data. It's just going to update its, its, its estimated state based on, on what it thought from earlier data with this observation and get a new update. It doesn't have to reconsider all the early ones. So it's recursive and it's online. It, it estimates this based on this incoming data. It doesn't have to go back and do a batch re-estimate from earlier. It's based on loose distributional assumptions. Uh, uh, Chen Wei Chang over there has done some wonderful work with Kalman filtering in past years, which is a much older approach dating back to Rudolf Kalman's work in the 1950s. Um, absolutely amazing work 
very well suited to aircraft navigation systems, or if you're designing rockets. Very poor need, very poor match to the, to the trade-offs involved in epidemiology, because it has very tight distributional assumptions, assumes normality uh, of, uh, of error for observations and of process error, of sort of the noise in the system. And so it's, it's very restrictive. It also assumes the system is linearizable, which raises problems for things like agent based models. But basically, the Coleman filter has very strict uh, assumptions, very, rig of, of very high strictures, and particle filtering very little. Uh, and has no reliance on the functional form of linearization of the state equations. And the way it's going to work is to sample from the state. It's going to represent the distribution of possibilities, ladies and gentlemen, not as a normal distribution with a certain covariance matrix and a certain central tendency, mean, say. Rather, it's going to estimate it as a collection of samples, but not just any old sample. It's going to estimate this distribution as a whole bunch of samples, which are going to have variability. But those samples are special because they have weights. A sample that has a weight of two is twice, carries twice the, the oomph. It's twice as frequent as someone that has a weight of one. And we're never going to, we should never draw from the samples without considering their weight. We always draw from them with a, with a probability of getting each one according to its weight. We'll come back to why this is later as time allows. Each sample layer is called a particle. And particles are not all equal. There might be a particle which has a very low weight, 0.01, and another particle which has a weight of, of, of 0.1. And that particle of 0.1, it's like there's 10 of them compared to that one with the weight of 0.0 for every one that has a weight of 0.01. Conceptually, we're dealing with the distribution defined not just by the value of the particle, but by its weight. Okay, and these particles. And this gets into the intuition. These particles are undergoing a survival of the fittest. Ladies and gentlemen, one of them, I'm tempted to get up and walk on these desks to carry away this message. The particles are going to represent, remember, particles are each representing a hypothesis for what's going on in the small. Each particle is going to posit a certain, it's a distribution <coughs> we're trying to capture over the model state. So each particle is going to have a particular belief about the model state. There's so many susceptibles, there's so many infectives, there's so many exposed individuals, and so many recovered individuals. So each particle has a cherished belief about what's currently the state, a particular vector of state values that it carries around. This particle thinks there's very few infectives, but lots of susceptibles and comparatively moderate number of recovered. This other particle says, no, that's out to lunch. There's lots and lots of infectives and uh, very few susceptibles and few recoveries. This other particle thinks something different. These particles have competing visions for what's the current situation. And collectively, the ensemble is a distribution. But the particles are in competition with each other. There's a survival of the fittest, nature red, and tooth and claw. Okay? Um, and what's going to happen is that as data comes in, we're going to find some of the particles are consistent. They're, they're, what they posit about what's going on is consistent with the new observation. And others are very inconsistent. The ones that are consistent will be rewarded with larger, larger what? Speak on, old youths. Larger weights. If you want, if you did, uh, I, if you won't give it, I will. Okay, so large weights. Their, their weights are grown, so they're considered to have more of them. They've multiplied. The ones that are fit are multiplied in strength. The ones that are inconsistent, are dinged with smaller weights. Their weights will be made smaller. Okay. Um, and there's a struggle to fit us because at some point we'll start throwing away the ones that have low weights in a resampling process. And these weights 
might seem very ad hoc, but they come from the theory of sequential importance sampling, as we'll see. Okay, so how do we perform particle filtering? So if, if we're associated with a, a model, um, like a model like this, which has stocks, these represent elements of state, state variables. We'll show them visually as we did earlier. Um, how do you perform it? Well, you take this model and you subscript it. Subscripted by particles. So each particle will have a separate kind of version of the model state. Each particle will be associated with its own thinking about how many susceptibles, how many infectives, and how many recovered so are. Each particle is, has its own thought. So we subscript this model by particle. So each state variable is going to have a different value for the first particle, the second particle, the third particle, etc. We're going to sample from the initial model state, and then we're going to go back and forth between a prediction phase and an update phase. Okay, I'm getting to really nitty gritty stuff here. So if you want to understand how this works, make sure your brains are fired up and, and pay attention closely. In the prediction phase, the model is just, each particle is just going to run in its normal way. We're going to run those differential equations in their normal way, recognizing there's some stochastics going on. We'll see that. But, but it's, it's just the normal stochastic differential equations, which are fine. Between observations, all the particles fall according to standard model dynamics. Okay? Um, uh, and it's basically numerical integration for, for these sort of models. The particle weights critically remain unchanged. We don't change the particle weights. In the update phase, ladies and gentlemen, is where the action happens for considering the observations. So when an observation comes in, for each particle, for each particle, remember, each particle has a certain hypothesis about what's going on in the world. There's this many susceptibles, there's that many infectives, and that many recoveries, right? And at the update, for each particle, we're going to compute for that particle's view of the world, its belief, that what it posits is going on, this many susceptible, this many infected, this many recovered. We'll ask, what's the likelihood, if that were the situation in the model, what's the likelihood we would observe this data, this observation, or observation vector? Okay, could be more than one observation. This many susceptibles, and that many people recover it, for example. We'd say, given what that particle thinks is going on, what's the likelihood of observing that? So this particle thinks there's no susceptibles anymore, there are lots of infectives and there's lots of recoveries. And, and we give it an observation that's of 100 new people being infected. We say, what's the likelihood of observing that? If there's no susceptibles, how could anyone be getting infected? There's no one to get infected, newly infected. And so the, we'll say the probability for that particle of observing that data, that value of 100 new infections is zero because there's, there's no probability that would occur for that for what that's positive. By contrast, a, uh, a particle that posits a moderate number of susceptibles remaining and a moderate number of infectives, ah, we might have a, a serious probability of observing 100, okay? A serious likelihood of observing 100. So here, the update phase, we're going to compute for each particle its likelihood of observing the observation. And that's going to give us a value. We're going to use that and multiply it by its existing weight. So if it's if that particle would posit a high likelihood of observing this data, this new observation will boost its weight. Its weight will become bigger. It will renormalize the weights after it. So compared to, relatively speaking, compared to other particles, its weight will become bigger. By contrast, if that particle has zero chance of observing this thing, it was, weight will be multiplied by zero. It will, it will be a bad particle. It will be a misbehaving particle. And its weight will now be zero. Um, and that particle will be in the doghouse, so to speak. It will be a particle that's very uncompetitive, and it will be weeded out in a resampling step. Okay? Um, and this is a survival of the fittest 
say periodically, we will go through and we'll basically resample from particles according to their weight. And those that have very low weight will tend to die out. Those with high weight will continue. So those, in short, that have a hypothesis about the world that's consistent with the observations will tend to survive. Those that have an understanding of the world that's at variance with what they've observed for this and previous data points will tend to die out. Okay, now, what's beautiful about this, and as we'll see, trajectories can be sampled. You not only could sample particles according to what's going on right now, you can, you can ask about their trajectory. So we're going to be going through a resampling process where this is, this is adapted from Lee Fabian's um, uh, thesis here. Um, so if we have time t and time t plus 1, we're going to have at time t, starting time t, we might have particles that have just finished being an update for an observation. So this particle at the top, it did really well. It was very consistent, perhaps, with the observation vector. And so it has a big weight. By contrast, this one was, was positing maybe that there'd be tons of people infected. And there was only one measly person infected. Well, I feel bad for the person, but one, one person infected. Um, it was infecting a huge number. So its weight has gotten dinged. Its, its weight has been reduced because it's been multiplied by likelihood that's very small. These particles are somewhere in between. And in the resampling step, after we do that, we'll resample. Once the effective sample size here becomes small enough, we'll resample. And the ones that have a big weight will be drawing from these according to their weight. So the probability of getting each one will be proportional to its weight. So we'll have 1,000 particles maybe, and, and now we're going to draw 1,000 times from these particles. And this one, because it's so big, will be very well represented. By contrast, this, uh, yeah, maybe occur these ones, they're slim pickings, and here they just die out. They, they don't get continued. And then we're going to give all the particles a weight of one. One. You know? and, and they're going to go forward, and they're going to evolve, and the next time there's a bunch of observations, their weights will be modified again. So this is how it's going to happen, and this is the survival of the fittest. These particles are less fit, they have low weights, and they're going to die out. Particles that are highly consistent with the data are going to be multiplied. Um, they're fruitful and they multiply <coughs> and continue on. Okay? And this is the resampling step that captures the um, survival of the fittest. So, this is a, uh, a lot of the gist of it, but we're going to go into some, some case studies. Okay, so the first vignette is going to be one I'm going to only cover at a very high level. Because I want you to get the gist of it for an example. And then we're going to go into one which is more substance. And um, both of these are, are published. So if you'd like to look up the paper, you can do this. Both are, are uh, open access journals. Um, this one's in PLOS One. Um, actually, sorry, this is, the, this is the model on which it's based, the mathematical model. This one is also published. It's available in preprint form. I think it may be coming out this week uh, in um, a uh, JMIR journal, JMIR Public Health. So here we're going to have a model that posits spread of infection, but it also posits spread of anxiety. So people within this model, this is published, Josh Epstein was at Hopkins at the time, uh, Ross Hammond, Brookings, um, and uh, two, two eminent modelers. Uh, here we have people who are susceptible. And those people can get infected, and they can recover, just like the model we've seen. But they can also become anxious and afraid. They can become afraid that they will get infected. This is based on a model of uh, uh, 1918 Spanish flu, where uh, there's historical records to suggest lots of people were very anxious, hid out, survived the initial wave, but came out a bit too quickly got hit by the other wave and died. It's a horrible thing. Something like 18 million died globally, including many here in Canada. Um, so here, individuals can get infected, they can become afraid, and they can become both infected and afraid. Okay? Um, and this model is described in this paper and compared against uh, 
against data, and um, it's based on a set of equations, which are shown here. I've used a different notation. Um, Leibniz compared to Newton. Newton preferred dx dt when he wrote the calculus Leibniz. Also writing in the 1670s, I believe, coming out with the calculus um, himself, uh, used dot, the shorter notation dot that we saw earlier. It's the same thing. This is, you know, I, I sub pf dot, okay? And so these are the rates of change on the left of the state, and it's based on the current state, okay? And I won't go into all of these, but suffice it to say that it takes this diagram and puts it into differential equations based on, on specific parameter values. Now, it turns out when we captured this in a particle filtering way, we added a few stocks. And these stocks underwent random walks. Brownian motion. How many people have heard of Brownian motion or random walks before? Okay, my, my uh, hat is off to you. That's great. So contacts per day was posited to not be fixed throughout the entire time. Indeed, with fear going on and so on, people might have buried that. But it was wandering, and its log was wandering randomly. You take the log, so, so we don't have to worry when it goes to zero. It can't go any lower. Rather, you take the log of it, and that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Mm -hmm. Common statistical uh, trick in statistics and mathematics. Um, and same thing with removal rate and reporting fractions. Um, and critically, we posited that people will search. Okay, if if they're growing anxious, they may search. Now, for this model to ground this model in a particle filter, we took data from Manitoba and and from Quebec, and I'll be showing each of these. Um, so we have clinical data, data from reliable sources of observations concerning the number of people who are diagnosed with either through te lab tests or clinically with H1N1 influenza during the, uh, uh, the flu pandemic 2009-2010. Uh, um, and the provocative question we asked, ladies and gentlemen, was this. We have this clinical data. We can use it to ground this model as if we were, we are back, 10 years back in 2009, 2010, and we're observing over time what's going on. And we can use particle filtering to take into account all the data till now, ground our model, and look forward, and ask what's coming, and ask the effectiveness, say, of an intervention strategy, such as um, uh, you know, prophylaxis with antivirals, or, you know, or immunization, immunization focused on different groups. So we could have done that, just focus on clinical data. But what we wanted to ask is a provocative question. What if we could do particle filtering in that way, not just with clinical data, but also with a lower quality data source? And what's that data source? <coughs> Guess what, it's coming back, search volume data. Number of people searching over time related to influenza, okay? How would that affect things? In, in health, you folks are probably innocent of it, maybe not. In health, there's a unduly <coughs> static view of a hierarchy of evidence. And up top of the hierarchy, in a disembodied sort of platonic way, is randomized clinical trials. And other things are considered to only aspire to the to the sanctity of those. Those, those are sort of the, the strongest evidence. I'm, I'm being a little bit sarcastic because the fact is there's lots of reasons to say that randomized clinical trials have enormous limitations and to say that they are unparalleled in their level of rigor is really exaggerating the situation. Amongst other things, they typically rule out people with multiple conditions, rule out uh, failure to comply from um, from the, uh, the the uh, the population of, of participants, etc. So, we're going to focus here on data drawn not just from that clinical sources, but also from 
from observation through uh, search volumes. So we looked at Google search volumes over time. Um, uh, these were clinical calls related to influenza. Here we looked at search volumes over time. And we did so for Manitoba, um, purely in English. And so we had different keywords that people were looking for, such as H1N1, uh, influenza, vaccines, flu. And you see a very similar pattern of cresting and then coming down. So we had large numbers of people searching online. This is very noisy data. This is very crude data. Someone might be searching for this for any number of different reasons. For a, you know, a university project, um, uh, a, they might be searching on it because you know, a, uh, a, a person that they know had H1N1 infection when they were young, and they just want to learn more about it. It's a very crude data source compared to clinical data. But we related it to the model. So the idea here was, look, we posited that, that um, when people get sick, they, they have a certain probability of being reported as H1N1 cases. So if someone's sick with H1N1, they might or might not be reported. Amongst other things, they might not seek care. They might not go to a hospital or a doctor for care. So there's only a certain probability that they'll be reported if they go. And even if they do go, they might not be diagnosed as H1N1. Maybe it will be mistaken for seasonal influenza. So we posited that when people get affected, which could occur here along this, um, this line, it could occur uh, at these other places aimed at by the uh, red, um, they become infected and they can get sick. And we assume that a certain fraction of those going down that pipeline would get reported fraction, a reporting fraction. So maybe 20% or 10%, okay? That was one of the parameters which we actually estimated in the model because we let it uh, vary, the reported incidence. So of the people getting sick, we posited a certain fraction get reported. And the people getting sick are just those going here, just those going here, and those going here. Hmm? Okay, but beyond that, we did something radical. We posited that those who are getting afraid, either because they have gotten sick or are becoming anxious, maybe someone else has gotten sick or they hear reports more generally of people getting sick, that those individuals are likely with a certain probability to search online for influenza. And indeed, we had a, a, a fraction of them that we posit would be searching for information related to this, to relate it to the observed data, okay? So the idea here is with particle filtered models, you've got to relate what's going on in the model to what's going on in observations. And this is the key link here, or this is a component of the key link, but as we'll see there's light to functions. So here, these flows that have red arrows coming to them, a certain fraction of them we posit to, uh, to being reported clinically, and we'll compare that against the clinical data we have empirically, and, and uh, similarly for the searching. Now the key missing link um, from my description thus far is the likelihood function. So L the likelihood of observing, Y is normally used to indicate observations, observing um, the, the data for the certain time point given the state of the model. That's the term traditionally is X, okay? That's the current state of the model as posited by a certain particle. Each particle, remember, at a given point in time, it has a complete hypothesis as to how many people are here, 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 here. Each particle thinks there's this many here, there's that many there, particular values. Collectively, the ensemble is a distribution, but each particle has a certain value. So we'll be computing for each particle the likelihood that given that particle state, given what it thinks is going on right now, the number of people in this state, in this state, in that state, and the number of people by extension who are getting sick, for example, or becoming afraid, that, that's completely given by the state of the particle. The number of people that thinks per day that should be getting afraid, for example. Well, ask what's the likely we would have observed this 
observation. Okay. And um, here, uh, we consider different distributions. We've explored a number of these. Um, uh, here, we ended up going for, uh, we originally considered for a variant of this model binomial distribution. And that was based on the intuition I was just saying, that each person is like, a, it's, for each person, it's like a coin flip. If someone's getting sick, we'll flip a coin. Unfortunately, I don't want to flip my plate. That would be bad news. Um, you know, it's kind of like this. Each person, we, we flip a coin and we say, well, it, it turns out tails, so they won't be reported. Um, in other words, maybe they don't present for care. This other person turns out heads, so they'll be reported. We originally considered that. We, we posited that each person is independent of the other and they, they uh, will be reported with a certain probability P. It turns out this poses some difficulties. So we made use of a close relative, for reasons I won't go into, involving negative binomial. Okay? Negative binomial is a close variant of it, but it's, it's a more accommodating set of possibilities. Uh, it allows for some possibility you'll get more reported cases than are the number of cases you actually have in the model. Um, rather than just saying, if you have 100 people getting newly sick in the model and you have 101 observations, there's zero probability of having that. It, it allows for, for some accommodation, which is important. So we made use of a negative binomial distribution. And here, this R, it's what's called the dispersion parameter. There's a close variant of this called the Pascal distribution. And this dispersion parameter, um, depending on its value, it will lend different shapes. So here, for example, is dispersion parameter one. Note here that this has a certain mean value. The mean value of this distribution here is actually 1,000, okay? And I want you to watch as I change the dispersion parameter. The mean value of this distribution, it's cut off down here, but its mean value is 1,000. It has a high likelihood of being less than that, but a high likelihood of being um, uh, higher than that. This is 1,000. Here's, here's um, dispersion parameter 2, r equals 2. Mean value, 1,000. But you'll notice now it's, it's uh, no longer monotonically decreasing. This is monotonically decreasing. This goes up and down. It's, it's starting to achieve a certain central tendency. Here's 4. Same mean, 1,000. But it's starting to look a little bit almost log normal. Here's 128, okay? Um, uh, mean, 1,000, but it's very tight around that. So the dispersion parameter lets us throttle how generous our interpretation is. Um, in other words, in terms of the likelihood, um, how if we're just a bit off, is that considered really problematic or is it considered all just in the noise? So by choosing R appropriately, you can get different results. And I actually have forgotten exactly what value we assumed here. I think it was 40, if I'm not mistaken, but I'd have to go back and check. Um, okay, so I want to show you the results from, so this is the situation where we have, just in those, like those earlier graphs, we have observations going on here over time. The model is incorporating, when each new observation comes in, it's updating the weights, therefore, by extension, the distribution over particle values. <coughs> it's getting this new joint distribution as applied by these new weights, and it's going forward. There is resampling going on. This is survival of the fittest. The particles that are not consistent with the observations are weeded out. Those that are consistent are kept in. And as a result, it hues quite closely to the observed data. It's like, you know, some particles reasonably, it's a stochastic system. It's a, it's a system with stochastics here. I should have emphasized that some of those flows are stochastic um, and some of the parameters are, are stochastic. Um, so actually, I'm sorry, it's the parameters which are stochastic. And because of this, some parameters, some, some um, particles think there's going to be more people getting sick, some less, and we're weeding out those that are inconsistent and, and keeping those that are consistent. 
or rewarding those that posit things consistently. So there's kind of this survival of the fittest. It's almost an ensemble method here. And then, at some point, we have no more data. Or, or we've incorporated all the data to the current point. And then we have to look forward, right? And as you may have heard, the old adage about forecasting. Forecasting is really difficult, especially when it's about the future. Uh, <laughs> and here, this is what we're having to, to do. But this is a special type of forecasting for a couple of reasons. One thing is we've incorporated all this learning from what's gone on here. The particles have been honed to be very consistent with the data. So we've got a bunch of well-performing particles that have taken into account everything to this point. That's one consideration. The second consideration is that we're not just simply forecasting based on these observations. Each of those particles has a full hypothesis about what's going on in the underlying model here. It has a certain value that it thinks are in each of these states. So the logic of the model, the mechanics of the model, the sort of um, semantics of it, the meaning of it, the, the sort of the, the, the underlying rules of it restrict sort of what can happen and tell us a fair bit about what's going on. So this model is actually not going to do all that well. This is with one likelihood function. We're only observing using the clinical likelihood, that data of high quality, where, where, where people have been classified by lab tests or by cl clinicians as to their infection status. And if we only take that into account, um, we can see, well, we've been taking into account all these clinical observations, and now we're asked to project forward it kind of shrugs its shoulders. It says, well, I don't, uh, I don't know what's going to happen next week. The next few days, maybe it, it, it pounds it. But then after that, it gets increasingly <coughs> confused. It's like, you know, my blinders are on and I'm wandering. And I get confused about, increasingly confused about where I am. I'm wandering around. And soon enough, I fall down the staircase again and break my foot. I hope that. Um, so it's increasingly confused. Now, the same model, the same model, of course, although we haven't fed it any data thus far, we've blinded it to any data about, about people searching thus far. We, we, are, we can ask how many people are infected, and, and by extension, how many people do we expect to be searching online? And you can see, it has some expectation for the number of searching online, but it's pretty, it's pretty far off. It expects a lot fewer people searching than are actually searching. Grounded by this clinical data, we're asking the, the, the really high performing particles, what do they think about the amount of searching that would be going on? And we're comparing it secretly on the side. We're not telling the model about it, the particle filter. We're comparing against how much data was actually going on with searching. We can see there's a big discrepancy big discrepancy between them. So this ain't doing so well. High quality data, right? High quality clinical lab data, lab confirmed data, good quality data from our system doesn't give us that much ability to pin down where things are going. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's take this high quality data and do something that many of my health science colleagues would cringe about. They might flee, think I was a mad computer scientist. I'm going to take this high quality data and we're going to mix it with low quality data and see what happens. We're gonna take this high quality data and we're gonna put in a bunch of low quality data and, and you know, you, you, you could be excused for saying, oh my gosh, this, this is gonna get even worse, right? I mean, it's low quality data. We're, we're adding in this low quality data into something that's already bad. How could be anything but getting it worse? It's like joining two sinking ships. <laughs> Sink even faster, right? Um, or even worse than that. It's like putting a big load on a sinking ship. Well, guess what happens? Low quality data helps. Because low quality data, ladies and gentlemen, has independent information. It's lower quality. There's lots of noise, but it has different information than the clinical data. It has lots of additional information because it's daily data. Can you say on search, 
But people search for all sorts of reasons. No one's validating the, they're concerned about an actual clinical case. No one's, cons you know, no one has, is checking that they haven't been infected long in the past. I, I mean, why are you searching? Maybe they're searching about seasonal influenza. But it turns out that it has other information in it that is substantial. It's more noisy, but it has lots of information. So it turns out it allows us to predict much better and further into the future. It allows us to predict the clinical cases. It's still not great, but it's good. To see greatness, we should watch the work of Li Xiaoyan shortly. But, um, but ladies and gentlemen, it also allows us to match up what's going on on the searching front, the search data. Not surprising to be informed with search data, the particles are shaped by, they survive. Survival of the fittest is informed by searching, but it allows us to predict what's going to go on in searching much better. This is Manitoba. Let us now turn our attention to the Deuxième Vague in Quebec, the second wave of the H1 influenza outbreak in Quebec, okay? Um, here's the Premier Vague and the Deuxième Vague. Um, we also have data from high quality uh, data sources, um, but we also, have, uh, we also have search data, in this case, multilingual search data. Um, Okay, single likelihood, it's hopeless. The, the better quality data sources just don't get us where we need to be. Um, it, it quickly, it's, you can't see the blue here because it's so confused. It's just, you know, it's got no clue where it is. Am I over near the residences? Am I, you know, am I approaching my office? Am I about to fall down the stairs? It's just kind of wandering around in this confused state. And in terms of predicting search data, well, it, it has some idea, but, but it's, it's, it's very poor. Now, you combine both. You combine the lower quality data sources from the, from the search volumes with the comparatively higher quality. OK, now we're talking. And now we're talking for predicting weeks and weeks into the future with some confidence. Now we're talking. And again, this is heretical in certain spheres. We're taking higher quality data and we are adulterating it with lower quality data and getting something much better out. Something where the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts. Systems competent data science. These different data sources are different faces of the same underlying system. The system as depicted by this, by this model. This model isn't right. It's just like a map isn't right, but it can be useful to, use to, to adopt the words of, of George Box, the eminent statistician. All models are wrong, some are useful. This is like a map. It, it's a useful abstraction. And it actually can let us make use of this data when combined with this particle filter. And we can show, we could show in terms of the discrepancies involved, root mean squared discrepancies, um, just how much we can improve things. But I want to show you more impressive work yet. And this is the work that we've done. Yeah. Um, this is on measles. This is a paper which we've published in PLOS One. Um, with uh, Alex Doroshenko from Alberta Health Services and University of Alberta, um, who has sponsored a bunch of our work on communicable diseases here and is a key contributor to that work and realizing it from a modeling perspective as well as from a public health perspective. You can look this up again, freely available. So what we're going to be using here is demographic data from Saskatchewan <coughs> across many, many age categories shown here in different colors for different years as well as monthly reports of illness, which are aggregated across every one of the population, just to count in the, across the population of people getting measles, regardless of age. And then yearly, we have it broken down into six age groups. Okay? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we base this work, like the previous one, on a published model. And this model was also by eminent modelers. Um, David Earn, whom some of you may know, um, Canadian modeler of some fame, Brian Grenfell, 
and Pesh Rohani, who's on our, well, wait, you may recognize his name, he's on our, uh, our panel for our, our pertussis modeling one. And here, the published model's equations are given there, appeared in the pages of science. Okay. Um, so we have a number of susceptibles, exposed. These are individuals who are, who, who are infected, but not yet infective. And so they're, they're, they, they carry the, the virus, but they're, they're not yet able to spread it. Eyes are infectious or infective individuals are, are recovered. And uh, there's some mortality and, and some birth uh, coming in here as well, um, some nat natality. And we, uh, for this work, we, we created not just a, um, a, uh, a, an aggregate version of this, but also a stratified uh, version, stratified by age. I can't remember, the original paper by Ernan and so on, did that have the stratification in it? No, okay, it was purely aggregate. Mm. So we created an aggregate, uh, a stratified version, meaning we, we distinguished different age groups here. So we counted the number of susceptibles of different age groups, the number of infectives exposed or infectives, et cetera. And critically, you have to have a, what's called a mixing matrix, because you have to know, like, Okay, if a child's infective, how likely are they to infect another child or to infect another adult? And similarly, you want to capture the fact that kids have a lot of contact with kids because they're in school with them or they're playmates of them, et cetera, and, um, and capture that. So this is a, this is a stratified version that's stratified by age. In fact, Li Xiaoyan created a number of stratified versions uh, with different ages of division between adults and child, for example. Now, to turn this into a particle filtering model, what we did is we made a couple changes. So we added stochastics and infection here. We also added some additional stocks, or state variables that evolve dynamically, that evolve according to random walks. So once again, the log of the it's actually sort of a contract rate times transmission probability, both represented by beta. That's evolving uh, dynamically, and so is a reporting reporting rate here. Okay, um, and that's what this DW is. It's a it's a Wiener process, which is a type of random walk. Okay, um, so there's system noise at these different places, and. What this means is at an aggregate level, we took these equations, which were the ones I just, of which I just spoke from that original article, and we, we then went and added stochastics to them. This is notation from the Stratanovich uh, uh, stochastic calculus, um, which I won't go into, but basically it indicates a random walk is being conducted on uh, the natural log of, of beta, this is a Wiener process, and um, a reporting fraction, and then there's some stochastics associated with the infection. So this is taking those aggregate equations and putting them into a stochastic context. We also, by the way, have, have some component here, which is integrated to keep track of the number of people infected in a given month or a given year. Um, and the stratified version similarly was made, uh, was made uh, to have stochastics. Okay, I'm gonna be going quickly now um, uh, to get us uh, to finish up here in the next 15 minutes. In addition to this, we needed to include um, a, a likelihood, set of likelihood functions. So there were really um, two forms used. For aggregate data, data that was across the entire model, um, uh, if we had a model that was purely aggregate, uh, we had a negative binomial um, uh, likelihood function uh, associated with it. Um, this is the dispersion coefficient. Remember that, as I said, it went from one to two to four, it was, became non-monotonically non decreasing, but got tighter and so on. That's what this R is. Um, and basically we posited that people have a certain probability of being discovered, um, uh, of being reported. And this is, again, the probability, this is a likelihood function, the probability here that a given observation will occur of total infections across the population given the model 
that given the number of people in the models, the model thinks they're getting infected. Okay. Um, now, for an age stratified model, we actually had three likelihood functions. One, that was a likelihood function by month that was aggregate in character, this general form. And then one for children on a yearly basis and one for adults. And basically, on year, the year end, it would compute with this likelihood function because it takes into account the cumulative likelihood across that entire year for children separately from adults. And then uh, on a monthly basis, it would just be, it, it, it's just one value across the whole population. So it's just taking into account this, uh, this monthly. And that's what this one is. It just allows it to, to only consider the ones that are relevant at this time. So when the t if data is available in an age broken down structure, we use it in our likelihood function. When it's not, we just use one. Okay. Okay. Um, we also tried calibrating the model with traditional ways. This involves tuning the parameters and then just letting the model run. It does not involve updating the model over time as new observations come in. It says, if we knew this was going to happen, we'd calibrate it. You can see it can kind of get some approximation, but it goes off pretty soon, and it's off in a lot of its particulars. Meanwhile, if we do particle filtering, observing all this data, the particle filtering hues quite closely around um, that observed um, observed datums here. Okay, um, uh, but let's consider it now. Oh, I should note that the model to compute this this is not curve fitting. Again, each particle posits an entire state of the underlying model if it's aggregate like this, and so. It has a certain number of children it expects to be infected and a certain number of adults. The model has some distribution around it reflecting the different weighted particles uh, sampled according to weights and comparing it with the data. It's pretty good about matching this data. Shayan is like a ninja at this. She's just incredibly awesome. She, she was able to, to, to do this in ways I'm just, I'm just floored by. It also posits each of those particles, it thinks there's a certain number of people of S, of E, I, I. And so we can ask for across the model, what do, what's the number, what's the distribution, say at time 200, month 200, for, for how, how many particles, for the distribution across all particles, uh, the marginal distribution associated with with susceptibles, or associated with recovered, or associated <coughs> with infectives, or associated with, with uh, exposed individuals. This is all implicit in the model. Each particle thinks there's a certain number of, of exposes here, and we can draw from each particle according to its weight, and some, we summarize it here in this nice graph. And what you could see is the model has a pretty clear-eyed vision for how many people at any one time are recovered, or are, uh, or are susceptible, how many people are exposed, etc. Time is a ticking, and uh, I'm determined to, to finish here. So uh, similarly for adults, um, the model in short, ladies and gentlemen, when you consider all this data to a certain point, the model has a very clear sense of what's going on in the underlying system. Ladies and gentlemen, the data generating process, it thinks there's a very good understanding of what's going on there, and it's very consistent with the data. So this model is like a weather report. With our weather reports, we don't just you know, look at the weather once a year and say, you know, January 1st, hmm, by January 5th, it'll be this temperature, by February 1st, it'll be that, and we don't operate off of that for the rest of the year. That would be madness, especially in Saskatchewan, where the weather is highly variable. Um, instead, we count on our phones and our weather reports to update us on an ongoing basis, to be updated with the latest weather on an ongoing basis. It's not operating off of reports from a month ago. It's operating off of maybe the same underlying model, but updated with the data. And so it is here. So we've gotten all this data along here to this point, say month 50. We've considered all that data till there, and then we can project forward in light of that evidence. Given where we're at now, given our understanding, our estimates for the underlying state, we can project forward what do we think is going to happen in coming months. Or, given all this data at the time 150, what's going to happen in coming months? I want to draw attention to something by way of intuition. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to get 
Time 150, you'll notice that there may, that there's very few infections till this time. Probably in these previous months here, there were some particles that thought, oh, there's coming an infection, there's a lot of susceptibles, there's gonna be infection next week, there's gonna be infection the next day. You know, there's probably a lot of particles positing that there's, uh, there's infection. Those particles are being weeded out. The, the particles that are remaining are those saying, you know, still no infection, still no infection. All those particles that have said no infection, by the nature of the model, those particles will all share a feature that the number of susceptibles is growing. The number of susceptibles has been growing. All through this time, the particles that are selectively weeded out are those that had shrinking number of susceptibles because people were getting infected. Those that remain are those that have been positing a growing number of susceptibles. And so as you go on longer and longer, the particles realize the chance of an outbreak is more and more. So it's able to anticipate these coming outbreaks. And this gives us kind of a picture on what's going on in the system earlier, as I said. Um, it turns out the model like this can be highly, highly accurate. Taking into account all this, for example, all this data till now, it predicts with high likelihood an outbreak, and indeed there is an outbreak. High likelihood there's an outbreak. Um, uh, here, from the peak of an outbreak, it knows, oh, it's going to be going down. Because all these particles, to explain this data, they know the number of susceptibles must be quite depleted. So it's going to be dropping now. Um, in the, the, the sampled uh, distribution coming out of it. At the end of an outbreak, it knows it's unlikely to take off because the number of susceptibles is highly depleted now. So uh, Li Xiaoyan did some very nice work comparing a model that was unassisted by particle filtering with one that's calibrated, one that's, that's particle filtering only at an aggregate and through various uh, stratified versions of particle filtering. This is from the published paper. And this is a discrepancy metric on the y-axis. So the higher the value is on the y, that means the further and further off it is from the empirical data going forward. Okay? And what you see is that particle filtering can greatly reduce the, the amount of error compared to even a calibrated model or an unassisted model, like the originally published model from science. Particle filtering provides that constantly regrounding that can allow it to predict forward. And par an aggregate particle filtering is very effective here, although in this case, I believe the minimum discrepancy model was this one here with 15 year division. So children are those up to, to are those in their first 15 years of life and adults are those over it. And we did a bunch of observations involving uh, discrepancies. Um, here, we, uh, Li Xiaoyan uh, created a ROC curve. Probably most of you are familiar with receiver operating characteristic curves, but fundamentally they allow us to look at, sort of as we vary things related to sensitivity and specificity, um, uh, how, they, how they offset each other. And Basically, if the model is perfectly predictive of whether there's going to be an outbreak, and this is what it's predicted, it would be um, uh, sort of go up immediately here. Uh, so you'd have perfect true positive rate with zero false positive rate. Uh, the closer it is to one, the better. This is a highly effective model for predicting whether there's going to be an outbreak in the next <coughs> month. And it does it not by some sort of curve fitting not by just connecting the dots between the observations, but ladies and gentlemen, by regrounding a full understanding of model state once new observations come in, having a survival of the fittest of different particles which posit different hypotheses for the underlying system state of the data generating process. And here, we can see with particle filtering, with with this very powerful machine learning technique coupled with dynamic models, a very strong ability to predict forward what's likely to occur because we are combining data from the mechanics of the system, the logic of how infection works, the stages of infection, the natural history of infection on the one hand, 
with this very powerful machine learning technique to reward hypotheses that are consistent with the data and downplay those that are not. So a model like this is kept constantly updated. And one of the best features of it is, like a GPS system, we used to operate. Probably you folks were too young then. But you know, we used to print out the directions, how to get from here to another city, and we followed those directions statically. The problem is that was fragile because if we got off from the directions, we don't know where we are, we don't know where to go, right? The directions were from our original place, but now we're in a place we didn't anticipate being in, we don't have directions from here. And of course, what a GPS gives us is so much more powerful than that, because wherever we are, wherever we happen to wander, it will tell us where to go. And so it is with this particle filtering model that it will, you know, wherever we are now, we can examine the effects of interventions and say, what would it take to lower the burden of infection given where we are now? Given all the evidence that's been gained, what would it take to lower you know, the infections in the next six months by such and such? And we can investigate our interventions here. Doing so with the logic of the model, the theory of the model combined with the machine learning um, techniques. And I don't have time to go over it, but I will say, that this technique is extremely well suited to streaming data, such as data coming in once every day, say from scraped websites, or data coming in from Twitter feeds, or data coming in uh, such as uh, UN has done amazing work with, or data from, um, from search volumes, uh, such as Refot has worked with and you feed it to a model that's constantly updated with this new data. The model has the structure of the system, the mechanics of the system captured, can therefore estimate the current state of the system, the latent state, distribution over that, what's likely to happen in the near future, and the effects of interventions. Okay, I was going to go into more detail, but there's not time today. By a claim, if there was interest tomorrow, we could talk with some of this. But I want to focus on those case studies because that was really one, what I wanted to, to bequeath to you was those, those final uh, case studies. Okay, I'm just going to summarize uh, a few key points here. Okay, um, so particle filtering continuously regrounds the state here of a dynamic model a model that captures the logic of the system given evidence from the latest data. It continually regrounds as new data comes in, it grounds that model. The model captures the theory of the system as we best understand it. The data ground that theory in actual observation and can compensate for its limitations. With the uh, estimated current state, this distribution of the the full state of the model, because each particle has its posited representation, its positive hypothesis for what's going on right now in the system. And collectively, all particles take into account their, their, uh, their weights. We can sample from, and we can estimate the current state of the system, and we can use it to project forward probabilistically. We just run those particles forward, uh, and for intervention evaluation. Um, it's often much more effective than calibration. Calibration basically involves adjusting parameter values to best match the data thus far. But this is doing much more than this. This is adjusting our understanding of the latent state of the system, what's going on in the under, underlying system. As we'll see with PMCMC, it can also support estimating parameter values for PMCMC. The choice of, uh, here it can do it for stochastic parameters. Um, the choice of likelihood function is very important and they have to be chosen artfully. It can take many lines of evidence. We didn't emphasize this, but Li Xiaoyan's example and the previous example involving uh, clinical data and search data brought home, hopefully, multiple lines of evidence from the same underlying system can give a portrait for what's going on and can allow us to illuminate what's going on in all stocks of the system, all areas of the system, even though we don't have data except a few places in the system. Because of the logic of the system, it tells us about what's going on elsewhere. Um, particle filtering needs to balance too little confidence and too much confidence. There's a lot of tuning which goes into these. Li Xiaoyan spent uh, maybe three weeks or a month tuning some of her models to perform 
best um, uh, given, uh, given data. And uh, model stochastics uh, are needed to make the model humble. But if they're too large, it's not going to be able to look forward to help you evaluate interventions in a very effective way. So there's a, a balancing of stochastics here that uh, Winchell and Lee Salian um, and others have had to, uh, had to work with. And finally, I'll say that um, uh, tuning uh, parameters in the stochastics makes a big difference for the accuracy of this system. Um, so particle filtering is very, very versatile. It's well suited to work with many public health data streams and, and stochastic models and indeed data streams elsewhere. Um, uh, in the presence of, of uh, even fairly aggregate models, it can perform well. It's not a turn the crank process. It does involve a lot of tuning and Lisa Yang could probably speak with, with anyone who's interested in, in some detail. Winchell, Wade, uh, uh, Young Chen, uh, refought all of experience with it as well. Um, and uh, there's some serious research progress that's needed to apply it to other forms of modeling. I do just want to know, I'll be back tomorrow, um, but uh, you know, conceivably in case you folks flee, uh, I will just note some upcoming events. We have an event that focuses on this area, this confluence of data science and system science in August here on campus. Uh, we have an event next week on this very campus involving smartphones uh, and use of them to collect data, including a bit of discussion about informing models uh, using that data, like uh, Chen Wei Chong has done extensively. And finally, we have a, a, a boot camp focused on this sort of dynamic models, these mechanistic models, particularly agent-based models and hybrid models, if anyone's interested. I will be back tomorrow with some very different content um, on several different things. We're going to be looking at smartphone-based data collection and using hidden Markov models for estimating people's postures and mobility, distinguishing people who are sitting versus those who are standing of points of some interest these days, distinguishing those engaged in active motion or lying down. And we'll talk a little bit also about distinguishing smoking behavior from other types of behavior using smartphones, okay? Um, and then in the afternoon, we'll have a, another uh, session yet. So it's been my honor to be with you for today. If any of you have questions, uh, I'd be glad to, to answer them uh, tomorrow. Um, we can start with asking questions about this. I do have to apologize because I'm due at a dissertation committee meeting and then to give a talk downtown to what supposedly is a packed hall down there at this point. Um, so I'd ask for your accommodations, but I'll look forward to engaging with you tomorrow in both the morning and as your presence allows it. As promised, I will be posting this video if any